speak uh, about uh, the idea of the European uh, integration or the crisis of the idea of the European integration and link it to the uh, Eastern European uh, topics. Uh, and I will speak about perceived or factual differences between uh, Eastern and uh, Western Europe. I will address the historical caesuras which made the historical experiences of uh, Eastern and Western parts of Europe similar but uh, non-simultaneous. Uh, in the second part, uh, I will speak about the genesis of the modern Eastern Europe uh, nationalism and track them back to the solid understanding of the nation. Uh, and in the third part, I will address the problem of contested narratives concerning the historical past and the importance uh, for the project of European integration. So one of the popular uh, opinions attributes the current crisis of the European Union to its Eastern enlargement. One can often hear about division of East and West or read that uh, countries have been brought to the European Union that are not interested in European integration. I quote here a random article from German magazine Spiegel from 2016, just one among many similar opinions. Even though uh, skepticism towards the European Union has long ceased to be a prerogative of Eastern European states, it is still necessary to ask why the Eastern European states of the European Union tend to return to the concept of national sovereignty, whether and why they oppose integration forces. An answer to these questions should also take into account the historical genesis of today's Western and Eastern Europe, which is of central importance for the concept of post-national foreign and cultural policy. An asymmetry between Western and Eastern Europe can be traced back to the Enlightenment. <coughs> In his book, Inventing Eastern Europe, the map of civilization of the mind of the Enlightenment, U.S. American historian Larry Wolf uh, showed that the Enlightenment uh, discourse of civilization excluded Eastern European countries from Europe and shifted them to Asia. The cultural or philosophical geography of the Enlightenment thus demi-orientalized Eastern Europe, which could be described as underdeveloped, backward, or barbaric. The Western European view of Eastern Europe even if not directly linked to political interests and clients. Nevertheless, remained uh, the gaze of intellectual mastery, I call it all, which simultaneously or retrospectively legitimized claims of political ownership. Most Western European states developed from empires or colonial states into nation states, while the Eastern European nation states, maybe with the exception of Russia, on the contrary, emancipated from the European empires. Therefore, a nation state already has different, if not conflicting semantics for a former empire and for its former parts. Another setting of non-simultaneity between Eastern and Western Europe dates back in particular to the post-war period, World War II, and the division into two opposing blocks. Georgian philosopher, Soviet Georgian philosopher, Mera Bamardashvili described this non-simultaneity as a difference between chronological and historical time. He did not understand the non-simultaneity as judgmental. Western Europe was not progressive and Eastern Europe was not backward. Uh, but similar historical developments uh, took place at different chronological points in time. The different contexts of thought cause differences which the Bulgarian scholar Miglena Nikolcina calls heterotopic homonymies. Theoretical and political uh, key concepts such as human or humanism could be and were in fact interpreted differently to the west and east of the Iron Curtain. In political theory, critical left thinking uh, was developed in the west as a critique of capitalism and has tried from Hannah Arendt to Etienne Balibar to relate the questions of social equality to the questions of political freedom and vice versa. 
For many left-wing intellectuals, the Soviet Union remained, and to a certain extent still remains, an alternative to capitalism. Uh, while they were not at all prepared to see the Soviet Union, at least in its uh, Stalinistic period, as a hell, if not the same, but comparable to that of national socialism. In the East, the questions of political freedom were of paramount importance. Eastern European intellectuals had to learn that relative social equality, which nevertheless led to an informal distribution of wealth, could not solve the issues of political freedom. These fundamental different experiences led to disappointments in mutual expectations. It is still a great issue of uh, very different understanding uh, of freedom and of, of equality uh, to the eastern, western parts of Europe. The third important aspect relevant to the difference, differences between Western and Eastern Europe concerns developments after the collapse of the Soviet Union and simultaneous rates of the European Union and its subsequent Eastern enlargement. While the member states of the European Union tried to overcome their experiences with nationalism in the 20th century in a supranational project of the European Union, the Eastern European states, especially the former republics of the Soviet Union, rediscovered the suppressed political nationalists. Comparison between the Soviet Union and the European Union is only possible in a very limited sense. Basically, only uh, the development vector can be compared, while Western Europe developed from the nation states into an integrative project, Eastern Europe despite all the differences in the political system and the involuntary integration mechanisms developed in, the, in an opposite direction from a common state or block of states into nation states. Although the Soviet Union could be described as an integrative supranational project, the nation, the concept of the nation, played such an important role as the concept of the Soviet Union U.S. American historian, historian Francine Hirsch described the Soviet Union as an empire of nations. The Soviet concept of the nation was a specific mixture between ethnic and cultural nationalism. The final narrowing of the nation to ethnicity only took place within Stalin's national policy and led to the outbreak of ethnic nationalists after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But even for the post-Soviet period, ethnic nationalism was only one option, a catastrophic one, made by various political actors alongside other concepts like cultural nationalism, religious nationalism, and state nationalism. The struggles for definition of nation, what nation is or how we should understood, understand nation, are still ongoing, not only in the Eastern Europe, but now, as we see in Western Europe as well, despite the formal commitment of the, to the state nations. The renaissance of the nation states in Eastern Europe can hardly be explained without their genesis from the Soviet national policy or Stalin's national policy. The oppressed political nationalists in Eastern Europe uh, after 1922 uh, and uh, between 1922 and 1945 did not mean that there was no place for nationalism. In his early writings on Marxism and the national question in 1913, Stalin already understood the nation as ethno-linguistic, folk cultural, territorial unity. His later version of national policy was based on the division into national form and socialist context. While the socialist context was politically related to the official state ideology, the national form was essentially reduced to the national language and culture, which was intended to express the general socialist context. In the Soviet Union, national feelings could not uh, be articulated politically, so culture became its prime primer venue. Many conflicts that later became political and military, such as Georgian Atlas or Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, were fought in the Soviet Union by scientists mostly historians. Since cultural nationalism in the Soviet Union could not have any relation to present as well to the future outside the given ideological framework, 
Instead, it concentrated on the past. This past was imagined as isolated without any reference to presence and present and future, and often mythically transfigured and idealized. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Eastern European nationalists inherited this historical image formed by Stalin's national and cultural policy and relied upon it, mostly completely without any criticism or reflection as a starting point for domestic and foreign policy. Uh, especially since 1960s, attempts were made to create a uniform, not national Soviet culture. The failure uh, of integrative Soviet Union project led to the renaissance of ethnic and cultural nationalists, which after the collapse of the Soviet Union were available as more or less only forms of political organization, later supplemented by religious nationalists, and came into conflict with the external forms of political organization, and we can speak in uh, of them like facade, uh, about facade democracies where the democratic form is there, but the context uh, is uh, eminently nationalist. The genealogies of nationalism play an important role in the integration project of the European Union because they generate conflicts between future projects of the European Union uh, I think uh, this workshop is one of the tasks of thinking about this future, and the images of the past of Eastern and recently of, uh, also of Western European nations. In his lecture at the Martin Roth Symposium, Professor uh, Kurt Hübner complained about the loss of the European integration narrative. One could regard the integration narrative as the blueprint for the future. But any future can hardly be designed if one does not agree on the interpretation of the past. For many Eastern European countries, Russia and Ukraine, Georgia and Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, the dispute over the past has already become a serious source of political and military conflicts. The dispute over defining power of the past is at the center of the hegemonic struggles that have now arrived. In Western Europe as well, and in the European Union as well. The question of how to deal with different historical images and perceptions, some of which are mutually exclusive, <coughs> is a methodological question of historical and cultural studies. This is a point where cultural and educational policy can and must overcome historical and cultural wars. At present, uh, the development factors between Eastern and Western Europe seem to be uh, reversing. More precisely, the dividing lines no longer run between Western and Eastern Europe, but between the European Union and Europe outside the European Union. Strangely enough, countries on the periphery of Europe that are not yet members of the European Union and whose membership is anything but certain, like Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, or Balkan states, for stronger integration than the EU states, also the Eastern European states of the European Union, that are now showing integration fatigue. In the European Union, it is often believed that the integration aspirations of the Eastern neighbors have purely economic reasons. But uh, this opinion falls short. Despite of all the crises of the European Union, it still offers more attractive political model than its neighborhood, Russia, Turkey, or Iran. The view from the periphery of the, uh, Europe towards the European Union is different and much more optimistic than the view from the center of the European Union towards its periphery. This view must be taken seriously because it will, have, it will play a role for both uh, the integration of the European Union or integration of narrative of the European Union and the future of Europe, which does not coincide with the European Union. For about 40 years, the Eurocentric cultural model has been criticized. According to this model, Western Europe is responsible for modernity, innovation, development, while Eastern European and non-European, uh, while the European and non-European periphery is presented as passive recipient of this development. In 2000, 
uh, six, uh, the Center of Literary and Cultural Studies, where I work, the Center launched a project entitled Topography of Pure Cultures of Europe regarding the shift of the euro to the east. The idea of this project was to observe Europe from its supposed peripheries. Europe's origins ought to be multiplied and it ought to be demonstrated that Europe cannot possibly be traced back to Western European meta-narratives. Making this plurality of European voices audible is one of the tasks of cultural and educational policy. One example, uh, there are numerous cliches about Balkan and Eastern Europe or about Negro migrants coming from Eastern Europe and from the, from the Middle East. These cliches are mostly negative, as you are well aware of, and would portray Eastern Europeans or people from, the, uh, from other parts uh, of the world, other migrants, uh, as less developed and cultured, violent, criminal, and dangerous. Despite uh, all the simplification of this representation, there are people who spread these primitive cliches in European parliaments. To counter the above is the task of cultural and educational policy. A country like Georgia, where I'm originally from, for example, would be associated for years with Stalin, with uh, war, and with crime. Georgia was the guest of honor at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2018. Around uh, 200 uh, Georgian books were translated into German for the book fair. Of course, it is difficult to say that the book fair uh, and Georgian literature <coughs> fundamentally changed the picture and perception to a positive one, but in any case, they made the made, uh, picture much more differentiated. If they don't completely change the cliches, they will definitely question and challenge them. This is an example of what cultural policy can do in a very positive sense. Making images views and opinions more differentiated and making people think about what they would not normally think about. Thank you very much.